We are Fandom Roulette. Two nerds with a passion for history, video games, tabletop games, and, well, really any nerdy stuff that comes into our lives. While we might not be able to name every ship classification in Star Wars, or every Pokemon, or every spell in the player's handbook, well, one of us can. We're still here to have a good time. Hey everyone, welcome to Phantom Roulette, this is Joe. And I'm Cody. And on Phantom Roulette, this is a podcast where we talk about a myriad of nerdy things. Those things including such things as history, video games, tabletop RPGs, and any other near t- any other nerdy stuff that we want to talk about. We're keeping it. Uh, hey <laughs> Cody, what nerdy stuff have you been up to this week? <laughs> well, you know, now that we're on a bi-weekly schedule... A lot, all the time. Ooh, um, yeah. See, it makes this section more fun, I think. Right. <laughs> um, so the Steam sale happened. Um, so that was fun. I bought a couple of games on there. I got the pretty much the whole rebooted Hitman franchise for like less than like the full game, which That's is fun. pretty dope. And That's actually awesome, yeah. Yeah, and you know. The, the games are way better than the movie. I recommend them. And then I picked up a couple of, like, oddballs, like uh, Slime Rancher, which is basically you, like, go to some fantasy world and suck up slime and, like, you know, keep them and feed them, and they give you poop that you can sell. It's a weird game, mm. but uh, I'm I'm enjoying it. I'm also going through Phantom Doctrine again. It's a game we talked about a while ago on the podcast. It's basically Cold War Spy XCOM. And I'm almost good enough where I don't need to cheese save the game because I'm I'm a save scumming save scumming video gamer. I'm awful and the worst. So I I hear the I hear the booze from my street. I right. I I just walked by. I can hear it from the future. (laughs) Oh no. Um, Cody, are you or do you have divination magic i do call back <laughs> call back to the the last one yeah yeah right yeah, yeah, yeah. um and then th- besides that i'm you know the standard D D stuff we had our session last week which was a pretty was rowdy session i can't wait to do the campaign diary for that it was a lot of fun yeah um and that's about it what about you my dude uh i had a very spider-man couple of weeks hell yeah uh, don't spoil yeah, it so, i haven't seen it yet uh okay yeah i saw i saw far from home uh i will say this it's a lot of fun um uh i think that it's better than homecoming in a lot of ways nice no um, that's good i i feel like they needed to do pull all the stops on this one considering the uh the kind of marvel like build up yeah, it's well, it's one of those things where it's like, um, you know, like there were a lot of think people says like, what happens after Endgame, right? Because it's like, there were some people who like were just going to see these things. So it's like I've seen every one of these fuckers, and when Endgame's done, I'm done too. Like I've saw a lot of people say that, um, and I will say if it weren't for the villain in this one, I probably would have been the same way. But um, <laughs> it has one of my favorite uh villain, Spidey villains in it. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm which, actually really bummed that they revealed it so early. Like I yeah. I was kind of hoping that you'd find it out like as like movie. a kind of a surprise. Yeah, during the movie, but it was kind of yeah. I don't know. I feel like in order to get some fans there, they needed to like be like, "Hey, we're going to bring some pretty wild and weird villains." So, yeah. I will also say this too, um without going into spoilers, there was like an aspect of the movie that I was like pretty impressed with um which is i guess like in a roundabout way a conversation about like what is a legacy Um, okay okay cool which was pretty cool and then they put spider-verse up on uh on uh netflix i found that out on friday and i have watched it six times at this point um, Damn. because it's my favorite movie nice <laughs> i should actually watch it now that i know it's you, you know free and on the yeah on the internet's it's worth a watch. I'd, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on it because I think it's possibly one of those perfect movies. Well, uh, considering <laughs> my track record for movies right now, I'm sure yeah, I'll right? fucking love it. 
because I hate everything that I'm watching currently. <laughs> that That's fair. Oh, and then, yeah, uh, so uh, we played a really fun D&D session that had a lot of cool, fun little twists and turns uh, and was doing something I am a big fan of as I'm getting older in my role-playing game experience, which is uh, making us think instead of making us hit, um, which I'm always a fan of. So. Yes! There was lots of there was lots of puzzles and and um uh can I can I can I just say too is uh I've been having such a lot of uh so much fun with the world that you have built this time around. Um I was talking to a friend about it the other day uh and he recommended and I'm probably going to do it soon unless the steam st- st- the steam sale is over. Uh unfortunately by, uh, it ended by the time we recorded this it ended yesterday. Oh damn it! Yeah, eh, maybe it's still I mean, cheap. There's still like, there's still um games on there that are still in their like week sale because like that's fair. Steam does a lot of like they do a week like midweek sale, a weekend sale. Like there's always a game or two on sale. So I don't know. You might get rec- lucky. Yeah, my friend recommended I check out uh the Shadow Run. Uh, video game oh man i wish i would have known i would have bought that for you lickety split those games are oh. so good yeah it was like like 375 i want to say oh yeah uh but still like even at full price it was still like much cheaper than a lot of video games but yeah oh yeah and it's got tons of like not only does it have like the replayability of like trying to get through like the same missions in like unique and different ways but also like it's just like a really well crafted like story um okay actually cool. both of them i i was uh i would play through the first one again but i like restarted it like a million times and i'm kind of like burnt out of playing like burnt the out. first like 10 hours of the game that's that's perfectly fair but when I've i did finish before. it it was really good yeah i mean it was one of those things where it's like uh something i love to think about when it comes to like tabletop rpgs is like um you know, like how how would how would this society grow if it advanced like our society? Because I think a lot of times with like when it comes to like orcs and elves and and like dwarves, it's like if you're not wearing plate armor, then like is this even fancy? It's like I want to see like it's 1920s, you know, like Middle Earth, and like we're following like uh, rough and tumble, like you know, dwarf PI who's like investigating corruption and like the elven you know like the mirkwood elves syndicate or whatever and like instead of armor there weren't dusters so like this this campaign's really giving me that kind of feel and i'm loving it so yeah that was actually my inspiration for our current campaign was like detective noirs and kind of a kind of a healthy mix of a lot of things but like the two big ones is like detective noir and like x files yeah. So it I was definitely like, going know. to be like it's it, it'll I think it'll always be a mix of those. Like I think combat in yeah. this campaign is going to be uh pulled back quite a bit where mm-hmm. usually like it those are like the focal pieces. Like I'm really hoping that like the mystery and the intrigue are like the highlights. Like like yeah. our last session without getting into too many like no one will understand this. But For sure the party had to do a couple different sessions with different people. So not everybody was on the same key, but they were all going to the same area. And not, and yeah. not all of the party members knew that they were all going to be at this kind of climactic, like trade off of information. Like it was like a deal gone wrong. And it was a really cool moment for me as like, as I'm like weaving this. So like, I'm hoping that m- there's more of that. Yeah, oh, as we as we blast. continue, because that's kind of my goal for this campaign is to create more like of those dramatic I mean, moments similar to like the big reveal of the last campaign. Sure. I mean, hell, it it, it like that alone, you know, encourages it is exciting to like observe from just like a player standpoint where it's like even if I miss a week here or there for, you know, work or other things like you know, it's going to pay off in dividends, which is a cool theory. So, yeah, I like it. Yeah, I, oh. I also, I've, I mean, I've also just picked up a lot of things, too. Um, oh, and yeah. 
it's something that I like if people were to ask me like like how do you how do you DM and how did you get here? And a lot of it was like I stumbled my way here. <laughs> um I and I don't know if there's like an easy way to do that, but like this this campaign is a culmination of like the past like three, four years and like I'm putting more effort into this one because I'm making a campaign diary about it and hoping that as like a side branch of fandom roulette, people are interested in listening to this campaign diary where I talk about what the players did and how I felt about it. And like the tips that I like, like the things that I thought of in the moment, I'm like, Oh, that's a good thing for someone who's fresh, you know, fresh out or somebody who needs like a new view or experience. So, uh, stay tuned for, uh, more information about our, campaign di- uh, the campaign diary <laughs> Heck yeah um but yeah so shall we jump to that juicy juicy content absolutely we're diving in all right so uh this week i'm kind of uh i'm doing uh a little bit of what i was planning on doing for this season and talking about uh another thing that uh i would have talked about in week to week but um it's gonna happen kind of in our off week so uh, I'm talking about a uh, a novel by the French science fiction author Jules Verne uh, called From the Earth to the Moon, or um, the French name De la Terre à la Lune. Uh, so, this, uh, this is a novel written in 1865 by Jules Verne, uh, which tells the story of an organization that's called the Baltimore Gun Club. Uh, so this is a group of weapons enthusiasts who are living in a post Civil War America, and basically the leader is a crazy man who is like, "Hey guys, if we build a big enough gun, I we could definitely uh, shoot ourselves to the moon uh, in a pod that's going to contain three people in it." Damn, uh, sounds like fun, right? Yeah, for real. <laughs> uh, so, so he calls this the Columbidad space gun. Um, and basically, uh, this is, um, uh, it has three people in it. So it's the gun club's president, uh, his armor making rival, who is from Philadelphia and a French poet. Oh man. It's probably supposed to be a stand in for Jules Verne. How weird, right? Um, that is super yeah. weird. I would have never expected them to do something like that. I know how crazy, right? Uh, so, um, the the actual conversation about the novel uh, is is relatively short, except uh, there's a couple of really cool things that uh, a lot of people like to point out. Uh, so one, um, the theory is that uh, because guns create a lot of velocity, uh, a gun with a large enough barrel and using the right kind of powders and things like that would be able to shoot a capsule with enough force that it can break out of Earth's atmosphere. And it's a giant cannon, which uh, takes about a thousand dollars that is raised by countries in both America and Europe. Um, oh, wait, actually, now I'm wait sorry. a minute. Hold uh, up. This, it's, it's actually about four million dollars. Uh, oh, damn. But like, Hold up! Don't they know about terminal velocity and shit? Like, well, uh, wouldn't you need so. a constant like? Wouldn't you need a constant stream of like, ign- like, you know what I mean? Like, as soon as you yeah. shoot it, like you you lose. I don't know. That would be a huge I, gun. That's like some Death Star shit. Yeah, I th- I think. Uh, well, um, so this is the part that I think is kind of cool which is that Jules Verne actually did quite a lot of, um, he did a lot of calculations and things when he was writing this book just to like figure out the feasibility of these things. So for instance, um, the cannon um, requires an excavation, which is about 900 feet deep and 60 feet wide. um, So that they're able to basically, uh, that's about the size that the gun has to be to shoot the, the capsule. Um, but this is, uh, this is where things get a little crazier in my mind as well, which is, uh, apparently Jules Verne also did research into, uh, determining what the most feasible way to, um, 
what like the trajectory would have to be to fire a capsule from the earth to the moon and to also get it back from the moon back to the earth. Uh, so they fire out of a area called Tampa town in Florida. Um, no then, relation to Tampa, Florida. Uh, yeah. Right. Well, I mean, so <laughs> that's a crazy thing, right? Is where, where does NASA launch their space shuttles from? I don't, I don't Florida. Know. Oh, huh. yeah. And then when he continued to do his calculations, uh, basically, um, they land in the Pacific Ocean, which is um, the drop down point of the first manned spacecraft. So, like, this guy in 1865 writes this stuff and... Um, Basically, uh, he figured out like what trajectories, like he didn't get the, the practical math down, but he was able to figure out using his own science and his own calculations, what the most feasible, like direct, like route from the earth to the moon and back would have been. Isn't, isn't that kind of crazy? That's really cool. I love, I love when, uh, and I don't, I don't read a whole lot, but like when people, base their you know science fiction and stuff like on like legit like legitimacy and not just like it's sci-fi i don't have to explain shit like there's something kind of magical about that which is ironic in the way i phrase that (laughs) yeah no i mean it's just crazy to think about right like you know the fact that the ideas were out there uh it's just that the you know I, th- I feel like there's a certain level of, of jest in his suggestion that if you just build a giant fucking cannon, it's going to take you there because, you know, I'm sure he also thought about things like, well, you would also need some kind of like continued pushing and, and terminal velocity and things like that. Um, but the reason I bring this up, uh, this book out specifically, is that um, in during the Apollo 11 uh, mission the first man to walk on the moon, uh, Neil Armstrong has this following quote. So he says, a hundred years ago, Jules Verne wrote a book about a voyage to the moon. His spaceship Columbia took off from Florida and landed in the Pacific ocean after completing a trip to the moon. It seems appropriate to us to share with you some of the reflections of the crew as a modern day Columbia completes its rendezvous with the planet earth and the same Pacific ocean tomorrow. Like, I don't know. It just there was something about that that was so cool to me that this this guy, this this man writing about the, you know, the far off crazy, you know, scientific exploits of the future got it that close. Uh so the other thing I wanted to talk about um is that we are currently um living in uh about the timeline of um the first moon landing uh which was Apollo 11. Uh, and the first moon landing was on July 20th, 1969. Um, they stepped on the surface on July 21st. Um, and then they were able to spend about two, about approximately three hours outside of the spacecraft and collected uh, some lunar material to bring back to Earth. And then they were able to come back safely and land in um, the Pacific Ocean for a drop down. Uh, now, the reason I bring this up is, are you familiar with uh, the space race? Yeah, where America, the United yep. States of America, and Russia were basically fighting to just throw everything they could into space just to be like, hey, look what we can do. Exactly, yeah. Um, and so uh, while um, the you know while the astronauts of Apollo 11 were not the first uh, men in space. Uh, in fact, you know, they were hardly the first men in space. There had been, you know, astronaut John Glenn from Ohio, uh, quite a number of Russian cosmonauts and things like that. We had successfully uh, were able to land on the moon. Um, and that was, uh, that's, this is the 50th year anniversary of that, that uh, pretty momentous event, I would say. Um, so, yeah, uh, to talk to tell you guys a little bit about Apollo Eleven, 
Um, this was one of the first times that we see um, the uh, sort of three stage uh, rocket, which is you know still pretty much used today. Uh, the one of the major differences is that um, the the it was launched from Merritt Island on July sixteenth. Yeah, that's gonna be during that that would be during our next week. Um, so that's why I'm not able to talk about it next time, or or rather, I want to talk about it this time, not next time. But anyways, does this sound make sense? Um, and basically, uh, this was um about an eight day mission that involved not only landing on the moon but collecting services and things like that, which um was allowing allowed us uh to basically um study what is our closest lunar body um and it's just to me you know a a really inspiring story about um you know human innovation human achievement uh and the science that went behind it you know uh figuring out a way to give these gentlemen food water air things like that for an eight day mission um to safely get them out into space and back you know uh at this point they the soviet union had lost quite a few cosmonauts for various reasons either um you know like uh calculation errors things like that but the fact that we were able to get people to and from the moon um is nothing short of uh it's one of the most amazing achievements i think um of the 20th century by far. Um, so yeah, uh, there, it was a, it was, a uh, about two hours on the moon. Um, but for, for humankind, for mankind, uh, it was the promise of a, of a bigger, bolder future. Uh, I think another cool thing about this is uh, thanks to the magic of, uh, modern television and things like that, they were able to s- broadcast, the moonwalk home they were able to broadcast uh what it was like to live up in space so things like zero gravity um the now you know famous images of people you know like eating their pudding in zero gravity and things like that have you ever seen those images yeah those those are super cool they're fun uh they're quite a lot of fun things like that um yeah it was uh it was one of the coolest things and just the idea that this had been something that people had been talking about since uh eighteen you know sixty five with some level of credibility um within a you know a century we were able to to do it, which uh is pretty amazing, all things considered it wasn't a big old gun, but it was it was something um that had been imagined and dreamed about for for years uh now there are two sequels or rather there was a proposed sequel. Um, which is around the moon, um, deals dealing with the uh, what the men were experiencing when they lived in the Earth, uh, or rather in the space shuttle, rather. Oh boy! Uh, and then the next one, uh, this one sounds hilarious and crazy, uh, which is called the Purchase of the North Pole, the North Pole, uh, which has the Gun Club members uh, plan to use the space shuttle to alter the tilt of the Earth. So they're able to mine the mineral wealth of the Arctic. Uh, <laughs> Damn, I don't know why. that sounds dangerous. Oh, it's it's yeah, it's it's pretty <laughs> it's pretty dang dangerous. Um, and then one one last thing, um, you know, Jules Verne is uh pretty important for the like steampunk retro futuristic aesthetic. Um. You know, he was a guy, obviously, like, you know, his space shuttle was build a big old cannon. Uh, a lot of his things involve uh, gears and things like that. So uh, if any one of our listeners has ever been to uh, Disneyland Paris, which I don't know if that's going to be accurate or real or not. Um, in Disneyland Paris, they have a version of Space Mountain, which is modeled after um, the big cannon from Jules Verne's story. Uh, and the storyline of that roller coaster actually follows the storyline of uh, From the Earth to the Moon, where you are members of the, the Baltimore Gun Club, and they shoot you out into space. Uh, and it had a beautiful score, but I think at this point, um, it has... At, at this point, it's no longer 
following like that's the story directly but it still has that really cool jules verne design so yeah nice. all right any any questions about the apollo mission or from the earth to the moon yeah um yeah can you confirm or deny whether or not uh we to the there? moon and, and its general like trajectory like going into florida and shooting off a rocket there was any indication of why nasa would eventually go to florida and then do all that stuff or you, is it just coincidence know, that's a that's a great question um i think that a, a couple of things that like really um like why florida was chosen is that florida still kind of has a whole lot of nothing like no offense to our listeners in florida if we have any um but you know there were like big areas of land that they could they could purchase up down there to uh fire things off um and then i think i think the other thing is um there's you know with the exception of hurricanes like the weather down there is almost always nice so you wouldn't have to worry about like shutting down for things like the winter or anything like that so you were you could you could in theory have pretty sustained like you know rocket activity and launches but i mean it's possible that there was just something about like the lines of latitude and longitude of florida that um is is beneficial to rocket launches um who knows i i can't i can't speak for sure one way or the other i'd I'd have to do a little bit more research into that and i'll probably you know what i'm gonna make a note of that and i'll try to have an answer for you next uh next episode so yeah yeah um and yes we did go to the moon if you're a conspiracy theorist who says we didn't you're a bad person and i don't like you uh, <laughs> man called out yeah, love it like i we don't tend to do that on this show but like we went to the moon i'm convinced of it we have that cool picture of the earth and it's awesome yeah i i'm convinced that we also went to the moon there's actually a really funny like bbc sketch um from a show called web and mitchell where they talk about like the like they're like all right so i thought we were saving money by not building a big rocket and the lady responds is like well if people ask us how we got to the moon we'd have to show them the big rocket that we fired off they're like oh that's a good point so are we saving any money she's like no it's actually more expensive to pay a whole film crew and you know keep everyone quiet and pay them all hush money and this and that and the other thing it's it's a funny takedown of conspiracy theories like that so that's funny i like that yeah and uh and on that note is it time that we go into the <gasps> middle section hey everyone welcome to the middle section welcome uh, is the middle section is where we talk to you guys about various uh social media things that you should pay attention to and um follow us on stuff on it damn yeah. that was bad huh I-, I mean hey you know what there's a first time for everything. That's fair. We're, <laughs> we're always good on this show. That's yeah, a, that's it always feels like the first time we've ever <laughs> produced a podcast. Fan and roulette. Always professional. <laughs> um. So yeah, hey Cody, uh, I, I want to tell you guys about how cool you guys are and t- tell you how much I love the show. And I want to do that in less than 240 characters. How can I do that? You can do such by going and tweeting at us at fandomr underscore podcast. That is our Twitter handle. It's a pretty good. It's a pretty good Twitter handle. I would say it's a great one. Yep. <laughs> uh, now let's see. Um, but I want to send you a longer one where I tell you how much I actually hate your podcast. <gasps> uh, so how should I do that? Well. You can send a strongly worded email to us at fanroulettepodcast at gmail dot com. Ooh, that's uh, that sounds that sounds great. But I don't want you to have my email. I don't want you to sell it to the the Russian hackers. You know what? what can I do there? Well, if you I don't, seem to have tripped you up. I know. It's like I wait a minute. I do have a solution. You can go to <laughs> www dot fandom dot com and if you scroll all the way to the bottom right before all of our social media links there's a little area where you can type in like your internet handle 
and maybe a little subject of what you wanted to talk to us about, and mm. then a whole little box that you can, you know, type in whatever you want, strongly worded mail about how we're not great at the middle section or uh, how well, much... too good at it. Or the flip side, we're too good at doing the middle section. You can do it there. Oh, that second one. Um, hey, Cody, I want to tell a friend about this podcast, but they don't have a laptop. How? how that doesn't make sense. What? Um, where are places where they I can show some of them to listen to the podcast? Well, you can get our most recent episodes on our website at fandomroulette.com. We are also on iTunes, so if you've got an iTunes device, like an Apple product, like a phone, Mm -hmm. or 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 a pod, or or a pod, yeah. Do they still make those? Ooh, that's a good question. I don't Um, know. Guys, guys, tweet at us. Do do they make iPods anymore? We're so fucking old. (laughs) I I just don't have an MP3 player anymore now that I can stream stuff with, like, you know, Spotify and Pandora. But anyways, uh, we're on iTunes. We're also on SoundCloud. We are also on Google Play, if you have an Android device. And if you have something that you can listen to RSS feeds, like um, uh, Pod Addict and things like that, we are also on there as well. And we're also looking to, you know, constantly expand. So when we find new, uh, you know, forms of uh, distributing this, uh, you will be the first to know. Uh, they do still make iPods. Um, okay, cool. But, but tweet on it. But tweet at us anyway. Uh, and hey, is there any other social media that we can go to? Yeah, we're on Facebook and what? Yeah, Facebook where we do questionnaires every other week. Heck yeah. So, uh, and this week, or I'm sorry, rather, last time two weeks ago, the last time we recorded. Yeah. If you could invent one item from a sci-fi story, what would it be? One of the answers we got was the teleporter potty. Okay. Yeah, they never want to so, go to the bathroom again. Just transport that out of them. Oh, oh, yeah. That's, so it's, see, it's a I, my brain went to three different directions. Right. Because like, and and side tangent for a second because we've never done one of those. Never once on this show. In Harry Potter. They yeah. they like they basically just like shit and then like magic that away. See, that's what I thought like it was. I thought that's dimension. what it was. It's vanish me poop em is yeah. the, oh. the fan name for the spell. Right. So like, let's take that concept, mm. except it you never see it leave the butt. It just goes oh. to the poop dimension. I lo- I love it. Yes. And then when the poop dimension eventually ruptures, we are in some serious shit. Pun very much intended. Yes, love it. It's the next one shot I'm doing. <laughs> any other, any other uh, answers, or is it, are we just talking about the vanishing poop? We mm-hmm. were just today because we're we're trying to keep it nice and tight. We're talking yeah. about vanishing poop. Sounds great. All right, thank you guys for listening. <laughs> uh, back to the show. <laughs> Hey Cody. Yes. Has has Yoshi ever been on the show before? I'm pretty sure Yoshi has, but I always love well, to see it's characters come. Blue back. Yoshi this time. <gasps> and it sounds just like the other Yoshi, because I don't think they change the voices in the games depending on which Yoshi it is. That's correct. Whoa. I didn't know you spoke English. Yeah, I just don't let that Italian plumber know. Oh. Yeah. Actually, canonically speaking, he's not a plumber anymore, I don't think. Really? I mean... Yeah, I heard that somewhere, Yoshi is... uh, uh Yoshi, I, I, believe, I believe Nintendo said he was no longer a plumber, which is weird and bad and dumb. I mean, I guess it makes sense, though. I mean, here's the thing. But Probably, like, God, they know but... how to plumb, but they don't do it professionally anymore because they spend most of their time stopping a tyrannical turtle man from stealing, no, you know, nobility. Yeah. Well, that makes sense to me. Plus, he, like, does parties and invites the villain. They, that's, like, go That's car. true. Well, he's just a polite guy. He's also, he's, he's... he also has a PhD or something because he is a doctor. 
or an MD because he's prescribing pills. But um, yeah, a lot and a lot of pills. Yeah, like arguably well, you know, too many. Well, as we all know, Mar- Doctor Mario is re- is solely responsible for the. Nope, not gonna make that joke actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> I <knew>. all right. <laughs> Yep, yep, yep. You can you can fill in the blank, but I did not make it. Uh, yeah. Yoshi is asking, is looking at me. He's like, "Did did you watch any movies this week, Kylie?" Oh, uh, this um, his voice is so audibly good. Yeah, I just don't want the entire plot right now. It's this such a is good some like ASMR experience. shit. Yeah, like for all of you, go back like. 20 seconds and like turn off all the lights you know plug up your nose and just like turn yeah. this up to like a million and just listen to joe yeah talk like yoshi mm. vape, well to vape answer up that while question you're doing it. oh yeah you gotta you gotta vape we do not sponsor vaping uh <laughs> we're coding it, right actually. now <laughs> no i don't i don't vape anyway <laughs> all right what movie you got for me, bud? Oh, man. This one... I'm starting to see a trend with these movies. They're not good. They're not great. Some of them aren't even good. Uh, today, I'm telling you about Laura Croft Tomb Raider, the movie that came out in 2001. Ooh. Can't yeah. Super exciting. And you know... I'm surprised because when I went to Rotten Tomatoes, just because I was curious what people were saying about it, it got a 46% by the audience. Hmm. And that's not terrible for Rotten Tomatoes. It's, usually it's pretty damning. But like, this is one of the quote unquote better video game movies based on the Rotten Tomatoes score. Well, that's fun. Yeah. And you can already tell by the tone of my voice, I loved every second of it. Yeah, it's pretty much Cody's favorite movie now. Oh, man. So, hit me. Hit me. At Give first me glance, at, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Tomb Raider franchise, um, from what I know, because it's not, and, and I'll get into this, but it is a. It's it, it is the badass female version of Indiana Jones. This, you know, this, mm-hmm. you know, tomb, you know, she is the tomb raider. She goes into tombs and like takes the things out of them and usually it involves like you know, traps and wild animals and stuff. I and like I said, I only played the one like one of the more modern games. So, like, I'm not, like, familiar with the, the Tomb Raider franchise in any way. So, like, one of the ones um, where they draped her up a little bit? Yeah. Or, you know, made her look more realistic. Because if you look up video game Laura Croft Tomb Raider, oh, woof. Mm-hmm. She is, um... You can tell that a a boy made her. What? <laughs> Yeah, it's not good. I'm not going to describe it in any more detail, but go 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 look at the old like the quote-unquote vintage Laura Croft and uh, you'll you'll know exactly what I mean as soon as you see it. Um, White t-shirts ain't good for exploring friends. Also accurate. Um <laughs> <laughs> So, and the trend I'm noticing most video game movies don't want to take its audience seriously. What? Right. I... And I want you to know, this movie is... I was actually surprised by this. It's a PG-13 movie. Okay. I was actually expecting it to be R. Okay. And I will tell you why in a little bit. Um, But seriously, this movie literally, like, drags you through it with its flimsy writing. Okay. It's like... It's like these movies are so fucking afraid of hurting the fan base by missing, like, silly, ridiculous, minute, like, video game details that they forgot that good movies need a decent story and, like, semi-decent characters. And this movie has none of that. None of it. It's all, it's all bad. It's all bad. 
I don't usually get this upset about it, but it's so bad. So, like, the first three scenes in the movie uh-huh. are ba- they basically tell you like three things about her. Okay. They show you immediately that she's rich. Cool. They Good show start. you how like she's supposed to be this badass, right? Uh-huh. And then they also inform you that she isn't quote unquote ladylike. <gasps> Right? What? So here's how they do that. Okay. The Go movie on. starts with a kind of like Egyptian tomb. And okay. she, she like kind of like ropes in. Okay. And then all of a sudden, right before she gets like the, the artifact that she's supposed to collect, a fucking robot shows up and they spend like the next like 15 minutes with her just shooting this robot with two pistols over and over. What kind of temple was she in? So, I think it's supposed to look Egyptian, but you soon find out after she's done defeating the robot that in her home, she has a fake Egyptian tomb set up so that Mm. she can practice shooting robots. You know, like normal people have. Right. So, that's the first scene. And to be fair, she does look like a badass. It doesn't make sense. And it's Uh really silly that they couldn't actually make her in a tomb. Uh-huh. But here we are. Well, that's then, subverting audience expectations. Right. Then, there's the the immediate shower scene for the sex factor. Sure. And, you know, then this next scene where she, she leaves the shower, her butler comes in and uh, basically says, well, that's not very ladylike, you're nude. And you see a little bit of uh, side boob, and, like, that's it. That's, like, the <clears throat> first, like, three scenes of the movie is just, like... Let's show you Angelina Jolie naked, and let's have her run through a mock tomb with robots because we couldn't, like, there are so many other ways to show those three pieces of information Mm -hmm. without those scenes. Well, Cody, famously my favorite movie is uh, Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark. And that too starts with him in a tomb, and then it turns out that it's actually just his house, right? Am I misremembering my favorite movie? Um, oh God, it's been so long since I've watched... It was, a real, it was a real tomb. Oh, yeah, like... I was goofy. Why couldn't she... Why couldn't she just be in a tomb and do the whole thing? And then it's like, bam, we already know she's a badass. Like, you don't have to set it up. It can just be, like, the final room in the tomb. And then mm-hmm. she gets out, and then her sidekick's like, congratulations, you, you're you a fucking badass. But, but no, we get, get this... How get Angelina Jolie's side boob? Well, okay. I don't know. I'll take my paycheck now, Hollywood. <laughs> so, that's, like, the first bit that I didn't like. Nice. Secondly, the sidekick character... Who I've already mm-hmm. forgotten his name because I hate him. Has cool. like... I think like seven different lines total in the movie. Awesome. But most of them are filled with the word bugger because he's supposed to be British. So it's like that's like the most of his lines. He's just... He gets mad and says bugger! And just like they the whole movie word. is that. Like I... I Give me a, uh, if you want him to be British, just give him a British accent. Like, you don't have to, like, beat me over the head with that. Like, that's, bugger is not a, like, catchphrase. It's not something that, like, I don't care, like, how old you are. Like, like unless this is a G-rated movie, no one's going to be entertained by that. Then, we're skipping ahead. Because I'm not going to go over the whole movie, it's just bad. Okay. The object that she's trying to get, like, the whole movie's based around this object, this, like, um, this magical object that, that, uh, manipulates time. Ooh, that's kind of cool. Right, and, and you'd imagine it would have some cool name, like, fucking Horace's Millennium Eye, or, you know, the great, uh, Pandorica, or, you, you know, like, there's so many different words you could have used Zeus's in the... Dick. Sure, that's not what I was expecting. <laughs> um, but the, but you know what they called it? The time cube. The triangle of light. Yeah. 
That's the plot item for the movie. I wish I was kidding. They only refer... And even the... There's a compass or some kind of object that they need to find this broken triangle of light. Okay. And that has a cooler name that I've forgotten because I was so mad that the, the whole time they're just like, and yes, the triangle of light, we need to acquire it. And it's just like, I I don't care anymore. It, it, like, you might as well have just said, I, I need my paycheck. We need to get to my paycheck. There's another problem with the movie. Laura Croft is supposed to be, by the video game standards, from what I've read online, she's supposed to be this, like, super smart, super cunning badass. Uh, But we never see that in the movie. In fact, the way she finds the secret entrance to the first temple, because there's two of them, there's two temples she needs to find, she basically accidentally drives by it in her Jeep and watches as butterflies go into it, and that's it. Cool. There's no like, oh, I know this thing. And like, th- there's no, there's no intelligence in this scene. It's just like, huh, I'm going to drive by my fucking Jeep Wrangler. Here we go. <laughs> so then we we're going to, we we're going to fast forward to like the end of the movie. Cause again, it's just a bunch of nonsense. Yes. There is a character, a side character, not even the villain, just a side character who is played by Daniel Craig. <gasps> Ooh. Right. Which is funny because he plays an American. Ooh, even better, actually. Yeah, so Daniel Craig, who has to do an American accent, and Angelina Jolie, who's supposed to be British in the movie, doing a British accent. Uh-huh. So that's really fun. That is fun. Um, So they have a very awkward relationship because Daniel Craig's character is an asshole. He's, he is a Tomb Raider as well. But he does he does it for the money. Like they're like he's the you know, he's the anti hero character. And so she the whole movie is just like, I don't like this guy. He's an asshole. He's good at his job, but I hate him. But then they force them into this really rocky end scene where like the main villain throws a knife and kills Daniel Craig. He falls into the water and the movie like makes it seem like, Oh, I have to go save him because we have a relationship. And it's like, no, there's no relationship except for one scene in the movie where she breaks into Daniel Craig's room while he's taking a shower and they have an awkward conversation. Like that's it. There's no like romance. There's nothing. It's just blase, boring shit. And like, then they do the, Laura's got to go save him because. Reasons. For reasons. Like, it wasn't earned and it, I I don't know why she put herself in harm's way to save a guy that basically shot at her a million times during the movie. Because they have a connection, Cuddy. <laughs> I guess. And that connection is the film writers dragging us through it. Yeah. The climactic conclusion of this movie. I'm so excited right now. So they they put together the pieces of the triangle. Cool. The triangle exists. However, the main villain and the main character are next to it at the same time. So they get transported to a green screen where both characters are tasked with running, sprinting up a mildly sloped pyramid to acquire the thing and of course yeah yeah i wish i was kidding and she she grabs it and now all of a sudden she can just you know mess with time and so she goes back to the point where he where daniel craig's about to get fucking like knife stabbed in the chest Mm -hmm. and she bends time to turn the knife around so that it'll go into the villain. Cool. So, that being said, it works, sort of, except he doesn't die. Which begs the question, how come Daniel Craig died by getting hit by the knife, but this guy didn't? So, it ends up not working, and then basically Laura has to fist fight this guy while the temple collapses around them. And of course they do the, so you know how, 
and this is spoilers for Captain Marvel. Um, oh, yeah. You know how at the end of Captain Marvel, the villain tries to goat her into a like a legitimate fist fight. Yeah, and, and she blasted. and she basically says "fuck you" and you know blows him away. Yep, it was awesome. It was awesome. That was my favorite part of the movie, actually. This movie does basically the same thing. He goads her into a fist fight, and she's like, "Well, all right, I guess." I, and she's like, "Got guns on him." And she's she's younger, she's faster, she's better than this individual. But she's like, nah, you're right, I need to fist fight you to prove myself? Yep. Like, who she gives has... a shit? Laura, Laura Croft does. Then there's the whole plot hole at the end of the movie. Ooh. So when she finally... Kind of right. So when she... Right before she gets into the fist fight, she sees the triangle there. And she just pulls out her pistol and shoots it, and it explodes. And, like, that was her quest. The whole time was to destroy this triangle, because it manipulates time. Mm -hmm. And, of course, no one can have that much power, blah, blah, blah. But, like, she had to find the two pieces first. And if all it takes is to shoot it with a gun, why didn't she take the first piece, which she acquired during the movie, just so you know, and shoot the 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 half? So that they could never recreate it. That makes too much sense, Cody. Why would you go through the whole rigmarole of this fucking two-hour bullshit movie if she could just throw it up into the air and fucking skeet shoot it out? Because she has to learn how to... How to, how to point a gun at a triangle? No, she has to learn about hubris and power or something. It's awful. It's the worst... I don't recommend it. It's it's a movie that aged terribly. Sounds like fun. I'm gonna go check it out right now. Um, yeah. Uh, in a, I watched it on Amazon Prime. I cool. I rented this movie. Oh no! I spent money to rewatch this from my oh. youth. And you know Oof. what's weird? Did you like? I it remember. I remember as a younger person, I appreciated the movie a little bit. I didn't remember it. Like, I remembered certain parts. Like, there's, like, a temple fight where, like, all the statues come to life, and that was kind of a cool scene. But, like, uh, but I didn't remember most of the movie. Like, I don't even remember the end. Like, I can't believe the end, like, how to get the, the triangle of light is that both of them ran up this weird CGI triangle. And, like, the guy, like, couldn't keep up and, like, fell. Awesome. Like, it was so just good. so weird. It's so bad. I. <sighs> Anyways, this movie's awful for, for basic, and you know what the worst part is? What? It took five writers to make this movie. It always does, huh? And guess what? The writing is the worst part. It, it always is. I, I don't understand. I don't. And I feel Honestly, like my my theory on this, and maybe uh-huh. it might be something that you're alluding to as well, is I feel like no one in their right minds in the Hollywood industry would treat a video game movie seriously mm-hmm. because it's basically just a it, it's it's a paycheck for everyone involved, mm-hmm. and I feel like that's the problem is. You could make fun and interesting movies using those licenses, but no one gives a shit. No one wants to put the effort in because it's just a fucking video game movie. Like, that's how yeah. people see that. And I'm hoping that with Detective Pikachu and maybe Sonic, maybe. Oh, the Castlevania TV show is really good. Yeah, but that's also like a cartoon. That's okay, fair. Which I feel like, again,. Not, not that that's a knock, because it's great, but I think it's different because you don't have to get the same, or at least, and, and maybe I, it, it could be that I don't understand how, you know, this works, but, like, it might be a triple, like, is it safe to say that a triple A developed, like, cartoon or Netflix adaptation is the same, like, ballpark price as a, as a triple A movie? I mean, that's fair. And I think that's the problem is like, and, and, and this movie did, its box office was $129 million. Nice. 
it did pretty well for 2001. That's pretty good, yeah. So, I don't know. It, I It did not age well. And yeah. it feels like, um, much like a lot of video game movies, like the, the writers didn't even care. And they just wanted like to drag you through all those like trope, like those action movie tropes to get you to the end so that you could be like, hey, thanks for your money. <laughs> yeah, kind of. It's pretty bad. Sounds like fun. Yeah. Um, Yoshi's laughing at you right now. I know. I wah, know. Wah, 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 wah. Which yeah, actually well, somebody gets hurt, I think, but I mean it's okay because when I play Smash, I'll just only fight Yoshi's for like a week. Oh, he just hid. Oh, but he laid an egg, and you. Oh my gosh, Cody! Something popped out of the egg. Is it a garbage kid? It's a garbage kid. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so in Garbage Kid, it's it's a, sh- a show where Yoshi helps us by going to a little book called Xanathar's Guide to Everything. And rolls a completely random character for us to uh, talk about uh, and tell you guys about that you can use in your own campaigns, or you can write fan fiction for us, and I'll read it on the air, I promise, or anything you want to do with your little heart's content. Uh, so, this week, Cody, I'm going to talk to you about a little person named Harmony Hawk. Yes! Ooh. Harmony Hawk? I love that Marvel name. It's a good, it's a good Marvel name. So, Harmony Hawk yeah. is... Give me a second. My computer is running a little hot. Is a true neutral halfling bard. Uh, that now, sounds like a that sounds like a perfect name for a bard. Now they started off their life as an urchin, and Aww. they knew who their parents were or are, uh, but they were born in the Feywild. Ooh. They also fancy. have seven siblings who are younger than them, but their family is none. What? I rolled like a, when you roll like a zero on the family table, it says none. <laughs> because so, their parents disappeared to an unknown fate. Classic D. They lived a poor life well, in an apartment in a rundown neighborhood. That wow. Well, all seven of them? I'm I'm actually more impressed than anything. Uh or none of them because their family is none. No family, none whatsoever. Um, so they had a few close friends and lived in ordinary childhood, and they became an urchin because monsters wiped out their village, and they were the sole survivor, so they had to find a way to survive. Uh, this Damn. one just got worse and worse as I rolled in, my man. Uh, they became a bard <laughs> because they were a gifted performer and attracted the attention of a master bard who schooled them in the old technique. Cool, cool, They're- cool. I know, right? Their defining work is A Fool in the Abyss, a comedic poem about a jester's travels amongst demons. Their instrument... I know, I love it, right? This is actually a good character, and I might steal them forever. Hell yeah. Um, Their instrument is a tinker's harp of gnomish design. Cool, cool. And their embarrassment was the time on stage when their wig caught fire and they threw it down, which set the stage on fire. (laughs) Love it. They are 21 to 30 years old with two life events. Yes. They encountered something magical. They saw a creature <gasps> being conjured by magic. Yeah. And they were, uh, they had a supernatural ins- experience. They were ensorcelled by a fae and enslaved for four years before they escaped. Damn. Yeah. Uh, this is a, an easy one, I feel. Um, so we have a special, uh, a, a special. Uh, ranking system, which is would they go into hot topic and buy anything? Um, Cody, what do you think? Yes, and yes. I mean, there was literally, right? there was literally no question in my mind. As soon as you, I think when you hit like when you said family none, I knew that there mm-hmm. there was pretty much nothing that that book could offer that could sway my opinion. And, like, I promise you, fam, I did not mess with this at all. Like, <laughs> these are the rules that I got, um, and I stuck with them, and I was like, Jesus Christ. This is uh, so good. Uh, yeah, so, ob- obviously, like, obviously they go to Hot Topic. The computer isn't even threatening to end humanity. They're like, are you even kidding me? Why did you plug this one in? This one's too easy. Yoshi is yeah, laughing yeah. again. Um, God, usually the, the the guests leave after that section, but like Yoshi's yeah. staying. No, he left. 
Oh, okay, okay. He he giggled as he was leaving, or they giggled as they were leaving. Sure, sure. Because I don't know what gender that Yoshi was. Can they all lay eggs? So, um, yeah. And I mean, if we go by Jurassic Park standards, life finds a way. So that is true. Maybe all Yoshis have frog sex change DNA in them. Maybe, yeah. So anyway, headcanon confirmed. Um, <laughs> we talking, we talking magic. Um, Ooh, yeah. So, uh, th- uh, there's a, there was something. Uh, this might be a, a, a relatively small topic of conversation. Uh, but in Dungeons and Dragons, at least, there are like two major. Maybe there are more. Correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, there are at least two major sources of magic. Correct. Yeah, as I understand D and D fifth edition, there are two kinds. Yeah, maybe maybe um uh, Ravenica or whatever that book is called changes. Guildmaster's things. Guide to Ravnica. Ravnica, I was close mm-hmm. actually, surprisingly yeah. enough. Um, but those two, uh, I I think we I think it would behoove us to talk about these two major schools, uh, before we start like diving back into um, the the uh exploration of magic in general and and mainly just because um you can do different things in your world to i feel play around with uh magic in fun and unique ways so the two major ones as far as i'm aware are uh, arcane magic and divine magic correct uh so i'm going to talk about divine magic because that's one i understand a little bit better uh divine magic this might come as no surprise to you comes from the gods uh, the pantheon of gods. I never so, would have guessed. Um, according to like D and D lore, if you are a a um spellcaster that channels um something spiritual, so uh cleric, um druid, paladin, are those the only three? And rangers. Rangers. I did not know rangers were divine casters. Yeah, they are the paladins of druids. Oh, that makes so much sense, actually. Uh huh. Um, I never knew that. I have not given a lot of uh, thought to uh, rangers. Sadly, <laughs> um, I also we'll do... did research before this, so I'm I'm looking at my notes right now. Oh, cool, cool. Um, I mean, yeah, I I did some research, but I guess I didn't look at rangers because I just assumed they were hurricane casters. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, so basically, they are channeling um some level of divine energy, um, which uh there's two really cool flavory things about um divine magic which is uh depending on your alignment uh certain spells can manifest themselves in different ways um, okay so for instance uh i had one called spirit guardians no no, no. uh spirit guides i think they were called and uh they're this like this basically this like little um circle of spirits that surround you uh, and protect you. And if you are good, they appear angelic. And if you are evil, they appear demonic, uh, because of who you are channeling, um, like the energy you're channeling. Uh, and so this was something that was kind of brought up in our last campaign, but was never, uh, I, uh truly explored one way or the other. Uh, but basically, um, we had a character who might have started to piss off her God a little bit. Um, maybe even to the point of an alignment shift, and uh, it would have been interesting to see how her magic would have changed um, as her deity changed. Uh, would you like to comment on this, Cody? Are we talking about Banks right now? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Just double-checking. Um, with, I mean, a lot of that stuff... So, D&D 5th Edition does a really good job at leaving a lot of... Like, it. it, it is a comprehensive list of like rules and things but like they never they never really tell you mechanically like what happens when a lawful good cleric uh you know murders a small town of innocent people you know and that that leaves you up to the dm and i think that's i think that's like one of the big reasons why divine casting can be a lot of fun from a dm perspective because you can do stuff like Well, if your cleric follows, you know, a lawful good god and does something chaotic evil, like, why would that god give you those powers? Um, So there there can be interesting things you do from a story perspective, like the cleric losing their divine power for a hot second only to find 
that chaotic evil god that's like skulking around being like hey why don't you hang out with me instead i can give you different powers and uh, there's a bunch of different ways to do this in game um changing their domain is like a like a quick and dirty way of like yeah. making them feel different um just having the different spells like from a flavor perspective like just look different yeah you know like if you're a if you're an evil character maybe your your heel is like this kind of unnatural glow and like your eyes don't like you, like your eyes almost look soulless when they you know when you when you touch them and stuff like there's there's tons of like flavor like flavor things or even mechanical things that you can add to uh divine casting to make it like yeah. interesting um yeah and then the other major one of course is uh arcane uh, yeah which is mo- your your uh your wizard, Wizards, your sorcerers, your, sorcerer, your warlocks, your bard, your warlocks. I feel like warlock is a weird like cross section, but I don't know why. Because it's well, like you have to like sign a dark contract or whatever. But and that's not always the case. That's because true. Because in Xanathar's guide, yeah, in in Xanathar's guide to everything, one of the packs you can make is a pact with a celestial being mm-hmm. instead of your typical evil being. So yeah, warlock is a weird. Um, hybrid uh, i still think in the book they say that like yeah it's it's through the arcane that you acquired this contract so like they 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 describe it as an arcane cl- casting class but um, yeah yeah uh so then this one you're kind of like channeling the power the raw energy of like the universe um yeah to to cast your spells um so you know that's why a lot of these spells tend to be like elemental based um fire or um lightning you know water things like that whereas a lot of divine spells tend to do like radiant damage or are like radiant fire if a fire component is there not always there are some crossover um but yeah um and so i I would argue and maybe cody can disagree with me here um one of the cool things about having different kind of like domains of magic is uh fucking with the players a little bit um, because for instance, uh, at the end of our last campaign, um, you know, we weren't going to play these characters for much longer, but you cut the divine casters out of like the divine cycle, basically. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so like, you can do pretty detrimental things to like a character or a world by like either disconnecting them from whatever plane they draw their magical power from or removing that plane entirely. And then, you know, having these characters ask sort of larger questions about, well, A, where did my magic come from in the first place? B, what is my life now like now that I don't have access to this, you know, powerful thing? Um, and if if magic was all just one common source, that wouldn't be quite as interesting because, you know, for instance, our um, sorcerer could still have cast spells even though the cleric and the paladin were now uh, basically uh, fighters. Um <laughs> And and so I think that's an interesting thing. Uh, my wish is that there were a couple more varieties of magic um, or, like, sources of magic. For instance, like, I wish that, like, my Artificer, uh, I believe he's technically an arcane caster, but I wish that there was, like, a more, like, technocratic ma- magic. Um, I don't know what that would look like necessarily, uh, but, I, uh, you know, it'd be cool to have more of these broader ones. But as it stands, Arcane and, and Divine are, are good jumping off points for, like, what magic is in general. Because these things have to have a source, um, and with that knowledge, you can also kind of mess with your players a little bit as well. So, Yeah, and I also wanted to bring up... Uh, yeah, please. Because you, you briefly, like, touched it. Yeah. But I think... 5e and just dungeons and dragons in general does a pretty good job at making the different magic classes feel different yeah um because even if there are you know we you know uh bundled up like the the different arcane casting classes and the different divine casting classes but even in those different ones like a wizard plays very different from like a warlock for example uh, wizards have a spell book and, and all of their stuff is through learn. It's like book learning and learning how to like 
make the correct semantic and verbal components to, you know, incite a fireball to shoot out of your fingertips and explode on some poor schmuck. Whereas a warlock doesn't even have a spell book. They just like, they know these things because they're like, yo, like, I know you're a devil, like, give me some magic and like, I'll do shit for you. Or, like, the difference between a wizard and a bard. Like, bards, uh, they, you know, they have unlocked the, you know, the channeling spells and, like, spell casting because they've, you know, they've they've figured out how to bend the weave of magic with their voice. Yep. Um, and my, my personal opinion about the different classes and why I think this is important is that if you're if if you are playing in or building or doing anything with a RPG tabletop or otherwise, if you have different classes like this, like warlocks and wizards and clerics and druids, they should feel different. Uh, you know, of course, like you said earlier, there's there's always going to be a little overlap. There are some clerics that can cast certain spells that wizards can cast, and so on and so forth. But what's the point in having a cleric class and a paladin class? If they do the exact same thing. That's true. You, you might as well just make it one class and like RP, you know, role play that like, oh, I'm a paladin. I'm more of a warrior type if that's going to be the case. And um, I think mechanically like that's important. And it's something that new, like even I, even I did this when I started, like I, I thought the magic classes were, you know, some of them were OP and some of them, you know, were a little different. And that's kind of why I, in my first campaign with you, I limited magic uh, through the, you know, the game, through the game, uh, making it kind of illegal to cast magic unless you were like part of like a magic authority. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, upon, upon playing, I realized like, I mean, uh, fighters can pump out the same amount of damage sure it's not from flicking a a wand and like you know green acid coming out of it but that you know yeah. yeah and this is something i think we can explore in uh weeks to come so yeah yeah uh so we're gonna wrap her up i think uh um, yep. thank you guys for listening to phantom roulette uh please remember to rate review subscribe pass it along to a friend uh we do this for you and it's a lot of fun uh but you know it's always cool to have listeners so um exactly but uh yeah thank you so much for listening signing off for frame roulette this is joe and i'm cody and as always stay nerdy stay super nerdy